The clerk and I will maintain a consolidated speaking list of members wishing to speak. And before I get into the first hour, Mr. Julian, I see your hand is up. Mr. Julian, we love hearing your voice and I can't hear it. Would you like to unplug and plug in again? I understand a sound check has taken place for all members joining us in the virtual capacity. I'm going to I'm going to introduce the first panel Mr. Julian and I'll come back to you. I still can't hear you. Okay, hopefully Yes, I yes. can. Go ahead Mr. Julian. Th thank you thank you for your patience uh Madam Chair, I'm, I'm not sure why when the sound check works uh, that there's an initial problem, but uh, appreciate your patience. I, I just wanted to uh, flag, as Mr. Cooper did yesterday, that uh, following our questioning of the witnesses today, I would be moving uh, the notice of motion that I advised the committee of yesterday. Uh, so my intention would be to move that following witnesses. It, it could mean an extension of time past uh, the scheduled uh, deadline, but hopefully we would come to a consensus and a quick conclusion on that. This is the notice of motion around the public inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Julian. I recall you mentioning that several times yesterday. I will take that and bring you the floor after our witnesses. I appreciate you um, providing the space to ensure people who have confirmed their attention, uh, attendance are able to come and provide us information. Mr. Cooper. Chair, very briefly, let me say that we will be dealing with motions after witnesses, as Mr. Julian has uh, indicated, uh, but we will be dealing with the conservative motion first that was uh, shut down by Peter Julian to, to cover up for uh, the Prime Minister to block Katie Telford from appearing before this committee, who is a material witness to get to the bottom of what the Prime Minister knows, when he knew it, and what he did or failed to do about Beijing's election interference. And, and lastly, Madam Chair, uh, I have to say that uh, while I recognize our clerk is working hard uh, under tight timelines to have uh, Elections Canada, CSIS, and the RCMP, all critical uh, agencies uh, with respect to the matter of interference, crammed in the over a two-hour period uh, is really inadequate. And while we, I appreciate the witnesses being here today, uh, that uh, those two hours for the RCMP, Elections Canada, and CSIS, that uh, the only answer following today is that we'll need, need to hear from them again. Excellent. Mr. Cooper, once again, I know I see your hand, Mr. Julian, but what I'm going to do is these are public meetings. And I think that we were able to see yesterday the courtesy offered to yourself, Mr. Cooper, when you asked for the floor following it. Members all came together to ensure that was addressed. Mr. Julian has followed a similar model. And so you have three hours, actually not two hours, for today's meeting, um, where perhaps we can come to an understanding as to the order. For right now, Mr. Julian has asked me for the floor following the panels, and then I will let you have conversations. Mr. Julian, do you have to add anything to this right now? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to clarify the uh, market and disturbing disinformation of Mr. Cooper. We were actually discussing debating an amendment that would have allowed M M Ms. Telford to come to committee, and he tried to monkey with it, and it, it was unfortunate and ridiculous. With that, I am going to... Let everyone watching and present know that we'll be here for more than three hours today. And I would like to proceed with our business of the day, as I know people are very interested in this. So for the first hour from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., we will have with us Stéphane Perot, Chief Electoral Officer, and from the Office of the Commissioner of Elections Canada, Carolyn Simard, Commissioner of Canada's Election. I understand each of you will be providing remarks. And so, Mr. Perot, we will begin with you. And then Madame Simar will come to you. Mr. Perot, the floor is yours. Uh, Welcome merci. to Prague. Pardon. 
Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will state at the outset that I am not in a position to comment on the accuracy of the information in the Globe and Mail article referred to in the motion adopted by the committee on Tuesday, February 21st, as the information has not been shared with me previously or since. And while I encourage everyone to treat it with caution, the article raises questions that are of great concern for our democracy and for our national sovereignty. Foreign interference is not a partisan issue. It, it can target elected and public officials at all levels of government across public parties. Institutions have clear mandates that they have the tools to pursue those mandates, that there are mechanisms for, for collaboration and sharing information where appropriate, and that the laws are adequate. Canadians also have a right to know that every effort is deployed to tackle the threat of foreign interference, and I would add in that regard that I commend the work of this committee. While it is not possible to draw a straight line between foreign influence and the outcome of a particular election, acts of foreign interference attack the fairness of the electoral process and must be addressed to protect our democracy. When I appeared on November 1st, I spoke of the importance of a whole-of-government approach. I would add that political parties, electoral district associations, and local campaigns also have a crucial role to play. Foreign interference is conducted through a range of tactics, and countering those tactics re requires an array of measures, both legislative and non-legislative. Several suggestions have been made within and outside of this committee. None of them including recommendations that I have made, provide a full and complete answer. We cannot totally shield ourselves from foreign interference, especially in an open and free society, but we can and we must increase our resiliency. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Perrault. Madame Simard. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I appreciate the invitation to appear before the committee again today. As Commissioner of Canada Elections, I take the issue of foreign interference in our elections very seriously. The Canada Elections Act defines the scope of my mandate and covers very specific activities related to foreign interference. The role is complementary to others who play a key role in protecting our democracy and with whom we collaborate. Since my last appearance on November 1st, Additional allegations of foreign interference have circulated in the public environment and have led to complaints to my office. I am seized with the importance of this issue, as well as the need to reassure Canadians under these exceptional circumstances. I would therefore like to inform you that we have conducted a rigorous and thorough review of every complaint and every piece of information that has been brought to our attention concerning allegations of foreign interference in both the 2019 and 2021 general elections. That this review is ongoing as I speak to determine whether there is any tangible evidence of wrongdoing under the Canada Elections Act. This work is being conducted impartially and independently from the government of the day, the public service, and even the chief electoral officer. I note that the outcome of this work will allow me to determine whether the allegations have merit under our act. They will not permit me to draw conclusions about the validity of election results overall or in a particular writing. For reasons of confidentiality, I will not be able to provide further details regarding the ongoing review, complaints, or any, or any other information received by my office. As with any investigative body, confidentiality is essential to protect the presumption of innocence and, of course, to avoid compromising the integrity of our work. I would, however, invite anyone who has tangible information about potential wrongdoing under the Canada Elections Act, including any attempt at foreign interference in a federal election, to contact my office. I would be pleased to answer your questions. 
Thank you so much, Madame Sima. And so now we will get into six minute question and answer rounds, um, or question comment, however you want to do them. Um, and we will start with Mr. Cooper, followed by Mrs. Sahoda, a pre Madame Normande, suivi par Mr. Julian. Six minutes à chacun. Everyone has six minutes. La parole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, Commissioner Samard, it's really simple. When did the Prime Minister's office contact you about Beijing's interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections so that investigations could be opened? So thank you, Madam Chair, for that question. As I indicated in my opening remarks, the information surrounding the work that we're doing is protected by confidentiality, and so I can't provide you with that information. Prime Minister's office contact you, and on what date? Yes or no? Once again, Madam Chair, I have to give the same answer. Confidentiality requires answer that. That's fine. So uh, you, said, you said that there have been complaints that have been provided to Elections Canada. How many? And do they pertain to Beijing's interference in our elections? Yes or no? Well, first of all, Madam Chair, I would point out that the complaints come to my office, to the com office of the commissioner, and not to the chief electoral officer. So I will speak on behalf of my organization, the officer of the uh, the office of the commissioner of Canada elections. So uh, we did receive complaints. I won't repeat the information that I've already given. I have already provided the information on the number of complaints. For situations, there were 158 complaints. Complaints? No. No, 158 complaints concerning the 2019 election dealing with 10 situations. For the 2021 election, 16 complaints regarding 13 situations. How many complaints have been brought forward, or my question, if, I did, if it wasn't clear, how many complaints have been brought forward uh, since you last appeared here, and are they related to Beijing's election interference? Parfait. Alors. Thank you. So those files have been dealt with, but to re respond to that question, we have received two complaints that are in the uh, public domain, and I can confirm that today. But for confidentiality reasons, I can't go further with my answer. I uh, provide as much information as I can for Canadians, and so I can tell you. Mr. Perrault, uh, did you say, uh, so I see clarification uh, that I understood you correctly, that uh, the information that is contained in the Globe and Mail uh, report has not, that information, uh, no one has shared contents of that report uh, with Elections Canada? That is correct. Any information that on the face of it, may uh, relate to a possible offense under the Canada Elections Act would normally flow directly to the commissioner. So we have, so is what you're saying, okay, to the commissioner, is that information, contents, of the allegations contained in the Globe and Mail report been shared with Elections Canada, with, with your office? If I understand your question correctly, do I provide the information that I get with Elections Canada? If so, the answer is no. All the information that I receive is dealt with confidentially, and I act. Look, journalists have found, uh, they've reviewed CSIS documents that indicate that there was interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections. Why does Elections Canada not have that information? If journalists have that information, why don't you? Is the question to me? 
Well, it's a, that, I think that is the, the question to be asked to the sources of the journalists, yeah. Madam Chair. So are you saying to me that CSIS has not provided Elections Canada with any information about interference in the 2019 or 21 elections? You don't have any information? We, we have been working with security agencies. We understand the security environment. We, there are known risks and known threats regarding foreign interference. This is not news, but in terms of specific uh, elements, factual elements, they have not shared that with me. As have I you said, asked for it? Any matters that relates with compliance to rules in the Canada Elections Has Act. Has Ms. Samard asked for it? Madame, la Madame Chair, to answer the question, we have uh, agreements with CSIS that involve sharing of information and also assistance where required. The same kind of memorandum of understanding with the RCMP as well. Those are MOUs and those involve information sharing. So once again, I would have to say that this is covered by confidenti confidentiality. So, uh, how, so you can't say, you won't say. Well, pardon, how much time? <laughs> Here we go. Excellent. Um, thank you for that exchange. Just a reminder that if there's two people speaking on the mic at the same time, the interpreters have to pick a language. And so there's many people, I'm sure, who are interested in this. Um, so I would just be mindful of making sure one person is speaking at a time. Mrs. Sahoda, up to six minutes for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, going off of what we were, the in previous interactions just now, I wanted to ask the Chief Electoral Officer and the Commissioner whether their testimony today, um, whether what they can say today, I guess, in their testimony uh, would be any different than what they would be able to reveal at a public inquiry. Madam Chair, as far as I'm concerned, I have to, it's, for me, it's either one or the other is the same thing. And the Commissioner? Yes, I would say the same thing. Okay, um, then I'm going to move on to... Um, the Canada Elections Act. So there have been some changes previously made by the current government uh, in C-76, uh, where uh, there were measures uh, introduced in legislation to keep out foreign influ uh, influence, including money in our elections. And I was wondering if uh, I could start with Mr. Perot, if you could explain a little bit of what of what those changes were that were implemented by the current government. So the main, uh, Madam Chair, the main rule that I can speak to is related to what is called undue influence by foreigners in the in the act, and that relates to a prohibition of uh, of in incurring any expense during the uh, election period to promote or oppose a candidate or a party. There are exceptions for uh, personal opinion or for, for media, for example. Uh, this is a, a, a restriction which applies only during the election period. And in my recommendation uh, to Parliament, I've suggested that it be extended beyond uh, that period. There is also a, a significant review of third party uh, 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 funding uh, regime um, that was not specifically uh, aimed at foreign interference, but there were aspects of the regime that do target that. Also there, I have made some recommendations to Parliament uh, to uh, reinforce those rules in terms of how third parties may use the, their own funds uh, for regulated activities and how this could allow foreign funding to penetrate our system. So I have made some recommendations uh, in that regard. Okay. Um, were there additional powers that were provided to the commissioner through that piece of legislation through the Canada Elections Act implemented by the current government? Well, yes, there were administrative powers that were provided for monetary sanctions added. That said, Although that's a good start, 
we have already talked about whether there are improvements needed uh, right now. I have to use criminal powers to do my work. And so we don't have specific powers in the administrative area. Of course, uh, we are talking about uh, foreign interference uh, clearly. We have certain powers, but we don't have certain other powers like uh, the ability to summon witnesses and uh, force production of papers, and the monetary sanctions are very much inadequate. Uh, and so would they're just operating costs for those that are involved. So in certain circumstances, these are very light penalties. So those are some measures that have been taken, but it would be important to add other powers as well. That is something that this committee can definitely recommend uh, doing since we are all interested in making sure that the integrity of our elections is um, kept strong. Uh, you had mentioned a little while ago a mechanism uh, for a, mem a memorandum, I think, believe, of under a memorandum of understanding, perhaps is what you had referred to, um, that is in place for Elections Canada to receive information. You just mentioned now that uh, you have to use criminal powers in order to um, compel or investigate uh, any further or lay charges or penalties. Um, you said that you have a relationship with CSIS through this memorandum of understanding and with the RCMP. Can you elaborate a little bit as to how that cooperation works? First of all, I would like to clarify that those memorandums of understanding, the MOUs, were established long before this, these allegations of foreign interference came up. So they are being reinforced. And I think other memorandums of understanding might be needed in the future. But I want to point out that it is very important to collaborate, and certainly our partners can count on our full cooperation where CSIS and RCMP are concerned. They have told us the same thing. And. This question is to the commissioner specifically. Have you found uh, that through the investigations that you're currently uh, undertaking right now that CSIS and RCMP has been bringing you uh, information in order for you to undertake those investigations? I As I explained, I can't talk about the specific information but I can confirm that we have a good partnership and we receive information as needed. Thank you. And now we go to Ms. Normandin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to both our witnesses for being here. Uh, talking first about the background, we found that uh, we uh, we see from the media that there has been uh, interference by the Chinese consul consulate, and there was a recommendation that uh, one candidate be withdrawn, but the answer was that this didn't come under CSIS's powers to recommend that. So I would like to know whether the whether Elections Canada or the Commissioner's Office can provide that kind of recommendation if there is evidence of interference. I had that information, and this is a hypothesis, uh, because really this should come from thesis and not from me, the answer to your question. But uh, the commissioner, well, once again, this information sharing can be done from my end side to theirs and vice versa. And I would say that once again, uh, publicly, what comes out of all that is 
if we had a hypothetical situation like that, then it what I understand is that if there is evidence that a candidate is uh, the subject of foreign interference, neither of you could make a recommendations, recommendation to withdraw that candidate. What we can do is to make sure that the law is applied and it does not include the possibility to make that kind of recommendation. Mr. Perrault? The rules for nominations come under party authority, and so if there was a problem, it would be up to CSIS to get involved. To your knowledge, is there anyone other than a party that can recommend withdrawal of a candidate who might be the subject of foreign interference? I don't know anyone who has that authority. When you are informed about possible problems, uh, then do you usually have the information enough ahead of time so that you can make the adjustment, uh, make the adjustments, or uh, confirm that there is in fact uh, improper behavior? How does that work? Well. As someone who makes sure that the law is properly informed, applied, then this is a role that we play through my office. But once again, I have a very specific type of power, which is to bring charges under the criminal code. So that is how I can carry out my work and to take those official types of processes. Is there the possibility to uh, make this these allegations public? We have requirements that keep information from being made public, but are there ways for either of you to make these allegations public? Well, I just want to be clear that Confidentially, confidentiality applies not only to us, but also all the other organizations involved because we have to presume innocence and not compromise investigations. So once again, the work is done behind the scenes and there is a high concern for confidentiality because those are the rights that people have. But if there is a potential charge against a candidate, the candidate would be informed, would he or she not? Yes, hypothetically, if there was an investigation, I would think that there would be uh, witnesses and, well, I would imagine that if there were charges laid, then would, then would national security be taken into account when laying those kind of charges? Well, my decisions are independent of what government is in power and my colleagues as well. So they come under the act. So there could not be a pretext used to keep, if information can't be made public, then the charges might not be laid for that reason. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Julian, six minutes to yourself. Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Perrault and Mr. Perrault and Ms. Sima. You work every day to protect our election process, uh, and we really appreciate that. Your work is important. I know that you can't take a position, but the former chief electoral officer also called for a public inquiry 
regarding China's foreign interference in our elections? I know you can't make a comment on this, but there is definitely momentum for calling a public inquiry. King, the questions around the nomination process, it is true that uh, the nomination process Elections Canada does not interfere with, but every candidate for nomination does have to file expense claims uh, and file a full and comprehensive review of contributions they've received. Uh, in that case, uh, for a nomination, if, for example, a bus was rented to transport people to a nomination meeting, should that have been included in the nomination expense declaration? So to be clear, Madam Chair, uh, not all nomination contestants have the obligation to file a financial return. Those that have spent or received more than $1,000 do have to file that return. Uh, if there is a go specifically to the question, if a campaign, if a nomination contestant, sorry, um, uh, needs to file a return and has incurred expenses to promote his or her nomination, then that should be in, in the return, including the, the bus that you refer to. Okay. And in that, in that same note then, if somebody else paid for that bus to transport people to a nomination meeting, that contribution in kind is governed by what rules? What are the limits and how is that declared? Contributions, whether in kind or, or, or monetary, are governed essentially by the same rules. They are subject to the same limits and are uh, subject to the same disclosure requirements. So if uh, somebody rented uh, a number of buses and the cost was over $1,600, for example, or over $1,700, uh, and uh, that was declared as a contribution in kind, somebody else paid for it, uh, would that be a violation of the Elections Act? A, a contribution in kind or, or financial that is above the uh, $1,600 limit um, would be a violation of the Act, yes. Could a contribution in kind come from somebody who is not a Canadian citizen or not a Canadian resident? Uh, it has to come from a citizen or a permanent resident. And, and so any, anyone else paying for that contribution in kind would also uh, constitute a violation of the Elections Act? It would. If uh, somebody made a contribution, they were a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, and they made a contribution and that money was reimbursed to them, but they were still given the credit and the tax uh, receipt for the contribution, is that a violation of the Canada's Elections Act? That would be a violation. Um, there are many scenarios around that, but essentially if a contribution is returned, it's not a true contribution, and there are, there are uh, violations around that scenario. Okay, so th these are all cases uh, that could be violations. So if a complaint was issued even after the fact, uh, for a filing of a nomination candidate or for a candidate in the elections, uh, that is, is that not something that Elections Canada would refer to the Commissioner of Elections? If there was a, a factual element to the complaint, if there's any uh, basis to, to refer that to the Commissioner, yes, we would. It, 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 you would investigate it initially, you would look at the candidate's return or the candidate's nomination return, and if you see discrepancies or if the complaint touches on things that have not been declared within those uh, within those declarations, uh, you would you would be investigating it and then referring it to the Commissioner of Elections. We, we would use that information as part of the audit, inform the audit. But depending on the nature of the information uh, and what we find in the audit, uh, if there is any uh, potential violation, we don't make that determination. If there's a possible violation of the act, then it is referred to the commissioner. It is her decision alone to decide how to deal with the matter. This can happen even if somebody has done their expense declaration and it's been accepted by Elections Canada, you can reopen a file if there is new information that comes? Well, if an audit file is 
closed. It doesn't mean that all is clear forever. It just means that it has been reviewed and it is closed. But if there is new information that affects the file, it can be reopened or it can be sent to the commissioner's office. I would now like to talk about offenses and violations. Uh, for example, we had a situation where Dan Miastro was found guilty. And uh, tell me about that situation and the violations. It might be useful. My office prepared a whole description that might be able to answer your questions. Uh, so we have the list of penalties compared with the the different types of issues. Thank you. Five-minute rounds by Mr. Cooper, followed by Mr. Turnbull. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be splitting my time with Mr. Berthold. Um, would it violate the Canada Elections Act to funnel money through proxies to a nomination or election candidate? Well, the directed contributions are illegal. illegal. Thank you. Would it violate the Canada Elections Act for a business to hire an individual under the pretense that the individual work for that business and then pay that individual to work on a political campaign? Yes, that, that would amount to an illegal uh, contribution, non-monetary contribution by the business. Thank you. Would it violate the Canada Elections Act for consular officials or staff at a foreign consulate or embassy to assist a candidate or a campaign during work hours? Um, it would, there are rules on volunteer uh, labor, and I'd have to verify the specifics on that. Okay, thank you for that. And with respect to uh, the penalties uh, that would uh, apply, could you elaborate briefly on those with respect to those uh, to, to a circumstances in which you had identified as uh, contravening the Act? Well, as I explained, Madam Chair, I have this table that indicates the violations. So we have to make a distinction between violations that have monetary or actual criminal sanctions. Thank you, Mr. Perrault. You, will you provide that information? Uh, yes, uh, we just want to make sure that we get all the information. Thank you. Mr. Perrault, have you had any meetings uh, with a meet minister or anyone else regarding Beijing's political or rather interference in elections? Has anyone from the government tried to communicate with you to advise you, to ask you for information, or to ask you to find solutions to this issue, which is increasing. And we have heard a number of times that this is a problem that <clears throat> is quite uh, uh, predominant right now. We work with our security partners. We work with uh, CSIS and others, uh, RCMP and CSE, for in some cases to do tabletop exercises, but it hasn't been an important enough issue for the Prime Minister to contact your office. No. <clears throat> Have you all the uh, authorities that you need to deal with CSIS? Yes. So. Are there things that CSIS tells you that you can't share with MPs right now? I don't have factual information about foreign interference, I deal with the risks that are present before the elections. So you haven't had any discussion with the PMO or with the Prime Minister for any changes to make or legislative changes needed to deal with the f 
interference of this type. My recommendations uh, to uh, Parliament were provided in June of last year. I provided a number of recommendations, and there are ideas on the table. Uh, have you had any answers? The committee has to look at the recommendations that I proposed, and uh, I will wait for that. Ms. Sima, you said in your opening remarks that, that there were 16 complaints um, regarding 13 situations and that all those files were closed. As I mentioned earlier, yes. In the briefing that Mr. Perrault received, uh, that was made public yesterday, I believe, we understand that Mr. Perrault referred three complaints to the commissioner, to you, were those three complaints that were considered to be of concern to the chief electoral officer, were they investigated? Uh, Madam Chair, I would ask for more clarification because we get thousand, uh, thousands of complaints a year, thousand in 2022. The three that were provided to you referred to you by the Chief Electoral Office uh, Chief by Elections Canada. I'm afraid I don't know which complaints those are. Thank you. Mr. Turnbull, up to five minutes for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so thank you for uh, the witness for being here today. Um, so I want to uh, just clarify. So here are the, some things that I've heard, and I just want to recap. So the RCMP is responsible for investigating instance in, incidents of foreign actor interference across Canada, and they do so based on information from their own intelligence and partner agencies. And the Commissioner of Elections is responsible for ensuring compliance with and enforcement of the Canada Elections Act. And you, Ms. Samara, do so based on your own investigative work, as well as the intelligence provided by partner uh, agencies and departments. And both these two functions, the RCMP and the Commissioner of Elections, make independent decisions on whether to investigate based on complaints or information received. Would you say that that's true, Ms. Samar? Well, generally speaking, that is the situation, yes. Thank you. And um, so we've seen, um, you know, circulating in the media reports that CSIS allegedly became aware of instances where the difference between the original political contribution and the refund a person gets at tax time was returned to donors. Uh, can you confirm, Ms. Samara, that that would be a contravention of the Canada Elections Act? Well, once again, this is a hypothetical scenario, and in that context, I can say that there are measures in the Canada Elections Act that could apply to that. Great. And uh, what about the other uh, CSIS, uh, the report that CSIS allegedly found, which is that uh, um, business owners hired international Chinese students and assigned them to volunteer in electoral campaigns on a full-time basis? Is that also in contravention of the Canada Elections Act? Once again, that is a hypothetical scenario, and for the under the financing provisions, there may be measures that apply, and that would be under the Canada Elections Act. Yes. Okay, great. And um, you, as being the commissioner, have the authority to investigate those types of matters. Is that correct? We allow. Yes. My power is defined in the Elections Act. I apply the Act. Sorry, I, I just, I'm short answer question. Sorry. Um, if CSIS became aware of illegal activity, would you expect that them to hand that over to you for a, for an investigation to take place in appropriate action? Mon uh, yeah. My expectation regarding my partner agency 
is for them to provide me information as soon as they receive it, anything that might involve a violation of the Canada Elections Act. It should be communicated to me without an assessment on their part. And that action, if there is action taken as a result of an investigation, would that be made public? The investigations are confidential, confidential for the reasons that I mentioned. And if official steps are taken, then the certain information would be communicated. And within Bill C-76, you were given new powers and authorities to compel testimony by applying to a judge uh, uh, to have uh, individuals um, basically be compelled under oath to, um, to um, testify on, on these matters. Is that not correct? I would say that, generally speaking, that is the case, but I could provide more clarification on that. But overall, uh, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. No more questions. Thank you, Mr. Turnbull. Madame Normandie? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Since the beginning of this questioning, we have heard a number of examples raised, and you have said that hypothetically, given the possible violations of the Canada Action Elections Act, there could be action taken. And uh, when we talked about uh, partnering, you said that you would get information from the other agencies, the CSIS and RCMP, and you would act on them. So th if there was any possibility of foreign interference. But yesterday we heard that the system as it exists prevents foreign interference, but I haven't heard that from you. So what prevents either the chief electoral officer or the commissioner, uh, what prevents you from actually taking action ahead of time? Well, one of the constraints is that we live in a free and open society, and that is a very good thing. We can say what we want on the social media. We can go to the bank and withdraw money and spend it how we like without surveillance. So when we live in an open society, there are risks that foreign governments take advantage of that. So we don't want measures that would involve actual surveillance of Canadians. But we do want to make Canadians aware. We want to work with government parties, riding associations to make sure that we build resilience in Canada, but there is no mechanism to prevent problems. But when information is provided that a foreign power is interfering and favoring a given candidate, uh, you can't take an ac action? Well, I don't know exactly what situation you're talking about or, about or whether there is concrete information. So uh, it's very difficult, Madam Chair, to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Perrault and Ms. Sima, there is information that raises the question of foreign interference. And if I understand correctly, this is not enough for a file to be opened or for a recommendation be, to be made for withdrawing a candidate or overturning a nomination. So working with CSIS or if there is a public complaint, is that enough to be able to look at the declarations provided again to make sure that there have been no of violations of the Canada Elections Act under the financing provision? Uh, but 
if we do have serious allegations, what does it take to reopen a file? On our side, I will quickly say that when the where the audit is concerned, we can reopen files, and we have done that based on information that is public in the media. If we see something, then we can review the audit and we can provide information publicly on the results. But if nothing comes out of the audit initially, I don't transmit anything to the commissioner. I know that you can't share the information with us, but it could be that you are reviewing and investigating certain files. I want to come back to the maximum penalties. On the one hand, there is the possibility in the case of an elected official that that member would lose their position. And so is that the ultimate penalty? Well, there is a whole range of penalties, and the commissioner can speak to this, but I think that the maximum penalty is about five years in prison, and certainly it could be the case that the, um, the member of parliament would lose his or her position. Are there measures taken to deal with foreign uh, interference from China or Russia, for example? Of where we're concerned, we try to protect our computer infrastructure as well as we can, working with the Canada security establishment, and we try to ensure that Canadians have the information that they need. We're interested in the information on the voting process to make sure that Canadians have all the accurate information. It doesn't it concern us whether the information that is out there about a candidate is correct or not. Um, just so our witnesses know and the rest of the day, we'll just be going over sli slightly to make sure that we do get this round done and that we have the hour with our guest. Mr. Cooper, five minutes to you, followed by Mr. Gerritsen before we uh, let them go. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner Samard. With the greatest respect, I find it uh, astounding that in response to uh, the last question posed by Mr. Berthold, uh, you said that you had no uh, knowledge or understanding of the particulars of the three new complaints. Uh, you're appearing here on a matter relating to serious allegations of foreign interference. Elections Canada is essentially the body, your office as commissioner, to enforce the law. And it's, again, I submit unacceptable that you've come to this committee that ill-prepared. And uh, moving on, I will uh, ask uh, Everett you, have you met with Katie Telford since 2019? Madam Chair, I've never met Ms. Telford. Moi non plus. I have never met Katie Telford either. Have you met with any minister in the government since 2019? In my case, I came into my position in six months ago and I have not met with any minister in that time. The previous commissioner, to your knowledge? I don't have any idea. Mr. Madam Chair, I do meet uh, the minister responsible for democratic uh, institutions, as I do meet opposition critics, and I've shared the invitation to uh, all parties to uh, hear from them concerns that they have and, and talk about some of the uh, uh, major priorities for our agency. Have you, so I have have you, met. Okay, thank you for that. Have you met with any minister's office staff since 2019 to both of you in the context of in, meeting in the minister he uh, he or she is accompanied typically by uh by staff but never staff independent of the minister no never okay. Moi non plus. i haven't either what about uh security cleared 
uh, st uh, st staff or other officials of the Liberal Party of Canada. No, no, just the advisory committee in June uh, on behalf of pol political parties. I met with people then, but not otherwise. Clee, through the advisory committee of political parties, Madam Chair, uh, and at that committee, uh, I have a standing invitation for the commissioner, but we meet regularly with senior executives from all parties. Okay. Well, then, thank you for that. I would uh, ask if you to if you'd be prepared to undertake to provide to this committee uh, the dates and names of the ministers and ministers' office staff to to the degree that that is possible, uh, along with any liberal party staff or officials uh, that you have met with since 2019. Will you undertake that? Since presumably January 2019. Since January 2019. Sure. The, the minutes of the uh, meetings are on our website and membership is, is, is public, so there's no confidential oh, Will you provide? I will provide that provide to Provide a detailed chair. list of this committee. I, I will do that, Madam Chair. And although you had indicated that you did not meet with the Prime Minister or anyone in the PMO, Will you go back and verify that as well? That will not be difficult. And, I've never okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. Berthold. Monsieur, Monsieur Perrault, est-ce que vous... Mr. Perrault, have you had any report regarding uh, uh, threats to the electoral process? No, not a report specifically, because my job is really to oversee the administration of uh, the election process, and yesterday I was surprised that Elections Canada was not on that working group to protect our election process uh, and that looks at what information should be made public. So if I understand correctly, you are not. Well, in preparation for the elections, we meet with various partners so that everyone is clear about their roles. We have that kind of communication, and we know if there is an issue, we know who should take charge of that and react. So the communication mechanisms are clearly established. So I understand that. It's not because we're not part of the group that we don't have a role to play in that. Well, you know better than anyone that elections, uh, when there's something at the beginning of the election process and the election process goes on, it's too late to react. Well, that depends on the quality of the information. There is a whole range of types of information, and so it all depends on the quality of that information. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and um, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Madame Simard and Mr. Perot, I want to thank you, um, notwithstanding some of the um, uh, unfortunate comments that have been shared around the table today, I want to thank you for the incredible work that you and Elections Canada do. The reality of the situation is, is that we live in one of the freest and open democracies in the world, and that's as a result, not uh, because of partisan uh, 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 members of parliament or politicians, but because of the incredible work that you do. And so on, in any capacity that I can, I apologize for some of the comments that have been expressed today, and I thank you for the incredible work that you do. Um, the, I just want to recap so that I fully understand this, and please feel free just to answer with yes and no if, that, if, if I have it correctly. So CSIS will receive complaints. CSIS will assess those. And if required, if they feel necessary, then turn it over to the commissioner to further investigate and take action on. Is that correct? If I may, the, there will be a, an appearance by, the, by CSIS right after me, so I will let them go into that. But I receive complaints, thousands a year, and foreign interference is only one small part of that. I receive complaints directly or through my partners. 
And I will ask CSIS that question too. Um, but so just to confirm, it is very, um, uh, it would be reasonably acceptable to assume that CSIS might get some information that they don't end up turning over to you because they don't deem it necessary to go to you, correct? I mean, CSIS must receive a lot of information, but maybe that's a hypothetical and, and you do, would rather not answer it, I understand. I don't know the unknown. Uh, yeah, fair enough. And just to go back to Mr. Cooper's uh, question in the original, the first round, CSIS did not provide any information regarding this global report to Elections Canada, to you, Commissioner? As I explained, for good reasons, for legal in reasons, I can't share that information regard because of confidentiality. Um, Bill C-76, which came about in 2018, that significantly increased the powers for Elections Canada to look into and investigate foreign interference, correct? Alors, uh I just want to correct you. It's not Elections Canada, but it is the Commissioner of Canada Elections. And uh, as was mentioned, one of those powers is to summon testimony. Is working? Is it, uh, has it improved the ability of the Commissioner of Canada Elections to do uh, your work? I would say that any in and any improvement is welcome, and for the future, it would be helpful to have additional administrative powers as well, because we have to look at all means to deal with such serious threats. I, guess, you know, my, I won't direct this comment at uh, the witnesses, because they do an incredible job of being nonpartisan, Madam Chair, but I guess I would uh, just say in conclusion that perhaps it would be uh, beneficial for us to reflect on the fact that the Conservatives voted against Bill C-76 when that came before the House of Commons that gave those powers to the Commissioner uh, to be able to do the incredible work that they're doing on our behalf today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. That was very appreciated. So on behalf of PROC committee members, I would like to thank both of you for your time today. I will echo the comments of members and thank you and your teams uh, for the service that you provide. With that, we wish you a good day. If there's any information that is outstanding that you would like to provide the committee or need to provide, please just share it with the clerk and we'll make sure all members have it. With that, committee members, we will suspend really quickly, switch over to the next panel uh, so that we can continue with this exciting day. Thank you. Good day. I want to welcome David Vigneault, Director, Michel Tessier, Deputy Director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and from the Communication Security Establishment, Caroline Xavier, Chief, and from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Michael Duhem, Deputy Commissioner, Federal Policing. We have until noon. And I think we will take a little bit of time after that to finish up. So I will ask uh, Mr. Vigneault to give his opening remarks. Welcome. Merci beaucoup, uh, thank you very much, members of the committee. And good morning. Like to, uh, inviting uh, CSIS uh, and our colleagues to appear on foreign interference threats to Canada's democratic institutions. CSIS continues to view hostile activities by foreign state actors as the most significant strategic threat to Canada's national security community. Foreign interference in our democratic institutions is particular, undermines Canadian society. Foreign state actors who engage in these deceptive, covert and hostile activities seek to weaken trust in our fundamental institution and processes, threaten communities, sow division, and ultimately influence policy. As CISIS officially, officials recently told this committee, foreign interference can take multiple forms. Threat actors may aggressively threaten 
or coerce their targets into acting in a certain way. This is a common activity impacting Canada's diverse communities and can involve threats to them or their family outside Canada. Threat actors may also cultivate relationships with targets to manipulate them into providing favors and valuable information or may conduct corrupt or illicit financing activities. It is also important to note that threat actors may use others as proxies to conduct these activities on their behalf. Of the techniques that foreign state actors employ to influence public discourse, the behavior of individual Canadians, and even our democratic processes to their advantage. We have also observed them to deploy uh, cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, and espionage to these ends. Foreign interference is therefore a complex and enduring threat to Canada's sovereignty. I can assure you that CSIS takes all allegations of foreign interference very seriously and uses its authorities under the CSIS Act to investigate, provide advice to government, and where appropriate, take measures to reduce the threat. Building resilience to foreign interference is one way to mitigate its coercive effects. CSIS has spoken, uh, spoken publicly in a variety of, of forums to warn Canadians about these threats and these techniques and inform them of ways they can protect themselves. We have also provided defensive briefings to elected officials from all orders of government across Canada. Perhaps most central to these efforts is our engagement with Canadian communities. We have been clear that the principal threat to Canada comes from the People's Republic of China. But to be clear, the threat does not come from the Chinese people, but rather from the Chinese Communist Party and the government of China. Indeed, we are keenly aware that Chinese communities are often the primary victims of PRC foreign interference efforts in Canada. The service continues aussi à investir we therefore continue to invest significant effort in building relationships with individuals, communities, and community leaders to establish and sustain trust and to offer our support and partnership in their protection. Furthermore, furthermore these efforts are not limited to Chinese Canadian communities. CSIS takes allegation of authorized release of classified information very seriously. Compromises of this kind can reveal sensitive sources, methodologies, and techniques to Canada's adversaries. They are listening. This can subsequently threaten the integrity of our operations and even the physical safety and security of human sources and employees. Ultimately, such releases can hinder our ability to protect Canadians. Therefore, I would like to remind the committee that, just as with other recent appearances in front of uh, PROC and other committees here, I am limited in what we can say in an unclassified setting. CSIS cannot publicly, in fact, prohibited from commenting on operational matters and classified information in order to protect the safety and security of Canadians. Nonetheless, I welcome this opportunity for a frank and transparent discussion to the extent possible on the foreign difference threats to Canada that Canada faces, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Merci, Madame Lacan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Vigneault. Um, and so we will start with our six-minute rounds. It will start with Mr. Cooper, followed by Mrs. Romanado, suivi par Madame Goudreau, et puis Mr. Ms. Goudreau, Ms. Normandin, rather, and then Mr. Julian. I everyone that comments should go through the chair, and there should be one voice being heard at a time. Mr. Cooper, six minutes to you. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses, and I would like to uh, uh, just express uh, and associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Vinot in saying that the interference that we see in the threat posed by the Beijing Communist Party has nothing to do with Chinese Canadians who are victims of the regime and their interference activities. It's very important we keep that in mind at all times during this, uh, our deliberations uh, on uh, this matter. Uh, Mr. Vino, um, how many times did CSIS brief the Prime Minister regarding Beijing's interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections? Uh, thank you. And, and Madam Chair, um, I have been director of CSIS since uh, 2017. 
I have had uh, many opportunities to brief the Prime Minister, Cabinet, and different ministers on the subject of national security, including specifically on foreign interference. Uh, I would not have a, a specific breakdown of the number of times since 2017, but this has been a topic uh, of ongoing uh, briefings. Will you undertake, uh, then, to provide the committee with a list of all the dates that you briefed the Prime Minister, but CSIS briefed the Prime Minister in regards to interference activities by Beijing related to the 2019 and 2021 elections? So, um, uh, Madam Chair, I understand that yesterday the National Security Intelligence Advisor was asked for a similar request. And uh, my reaction to this would be you know, to probably work with the Privy Council Office to have a consolidated response uh, to the committee uh, through you, Madam Chair. And uh, will you also uh, undertake to do the same with respect to uh, a list of all the dates that CSIS briefed any minister, PMO staff, minister's office staff, or security cleared Liberal Party staff uh, related to Beijing's interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections? So, Madam Chair, uh, I think, you know, as I just mentioned, we will endeavor to, to collide uh, as much of the, that information as possible. And uh, bearing any specific uh, national security considerations, we will endeavor to, to provide uh, as much as possible to the committee. Okay. And, uh, and I guess consistent with that or in addition to that, will you undertake to provide a list of all individuals who are present at these briefings to the degree that this is possible? Um, I will uh, probably have to defer to uh, the extent to which we know. We will, uh, again, you know, provide uh, the information in the context of, uh, of uh, any bearing any other uh, national security considerations, but we'll probably have to rely also on the Privy Council Office uh, for some of the attendance of these briefings. So uh, that consolidated piece will uh, hopefully be uh, answering many of these questions, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. On uh, February 24, 2023, Sam Cooper of Global News reported that three weeks before the 2019 election, CSIS officials gave an urgent briefing to senior aides in the Prime Minister's office, warning them that a Liberal candidate, who is a sitting Liberal MP now, had received assistance from Beijing's Toronto consulate in his nomination campaign. Uh, what are the names of the PMO aides who were briefed? Uh, Madam Chair, as I uh, just indicated, uh, we'll have to uh, review the uh, the list of uh, the and the dates of such briefings. Um, it will be important to uh, remind uh, colleagues that you know I will uh, or this committee, I should say, that uh, the uh, I, I do not take the premise of that the the, the question at face value. Uh, I need to be able to uh, provide information respecting the the proper. Uh, classification of the information, so uh, that the, the spirit of that uh, of that question will be answered through the consolidated response. And uh, and to that end, uh, did, did uh, CSIS brief the prime minister? Uh, CSIS, as I mentioned, no, no, no. Uh, but but specifically in relation to what I the the 2019 circumstances surrounding uh, a liberal candidate and Beijing's consulate in Toronto assisting his image him and his nomination campaign. So maybe, Madam Chair, on that question, uh, I think it's important to um, to put in context that information that is in, in the public domain uh, may or may not be coming from, uh, from the service or from other agencies. Uh, there's been, uh, indeed, uh, information that is now reported by the media. Uh, and um, it is not because the information is in the media that I'm at liberty to uh, confirm or deny the specific nature of classified information. So uh, uh, along these lines, I will not be able to, to provide okay. a specific answer to uh, I, I uh, th that allegation. I understand you're not able to provide a specific answer at this time, but again, would you undertake to go back and uh, pr provide this committee uh, with any uh, date uh, or dates that the Prime Minister was briefed on this matter? I will be able to provide, Madam Chair, uh, a consolidated response to PCO of, of dates where the subject of foreign interference was, uh, was discussed. However, um, I, I am not at liberty to disclose information directly or indirectly that would provide uh, classified information in a public setting. So there will be limit, uh, Madam Chair, to the specificity of, of the, the topic discussed. But uh, as I and said, I think it's I, important I, I, that people understand that you know, foreign interference was indeed brief uh, regularly.
Okay. And, uh, and the same would apply uh, with respect to Liberal Party staff or other officials who may have been briefed, if you could also undertake that, if they were briefed to come back to this committee, having regard for what you had previously said, unless it doesn't apply in that case? Um, uh, we will, uh, I think in the spirit of, the, uh, of these hearings, Madam Chair, we will absolutely endeavor to provide the most consolidated uh, and thorough response possible to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mrs. Romanato, up to six minutes for you. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to thank the witnesses for being with us today and for providing uh, the information that they are able to, because I understand full well, uh, given security issues, we can't um, publicly discuss in public things that we do not have clearance for. My first question is for Mr. Vigneault. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about the tools that CSIS has to disrupt foreign interference and in the Rosenberg report that was released this week, it says that one of the options CSIS has is to engage with diplomats who may try to interfere in our elections. So if a foreign official was trying to interfere in our election, does CSIS have the tools in its mandate to address that? So um, thank you uh, for the question. And, and Madam Chair, through you, uh, I would say that the CSIS Act provides um, a number of tools for CSIS to investigate foreign interference activities, including uh, when it comes to uh, uh, diplomats posted in Canada. We are, uh, as an intelligence service, uh, our professional uh, are looking at the best way possible to get at the intelligence uh, using all the techniques that are available to us. And when we do face uh, questions uh, or, um, or situation where there's a specific threat activity, we are also using, and we have used, and will continue to use our threat reduction measures mandate to engage in those activities. Um, uh, we will often, you know, uh, work with partners. Uh, we will not work in isolation because, you know, these uh, issues are, are very complex and you do not have one to take an action and have unintended consequences. So we work in partnership. So in this case, you know, uh, when it comes time to diplomat, we would be likely be working with the Department of Global Affairs Canada, GAC, to do so. But I can assure the committee that, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, that uh, CSIS and our partners at this table, we do take uh, any allegations of uh, uh, foreign interference extremely seriously. Uh, we investigate these, these allegations, and we use all the tools at our disposal to try to better understand, characterize the, these activities, and reduce the threat where possible. Okay, and, and thank you very much. CSIS has the ability to share information with the RCMP uh, for them to launch an investigation. Is that correct? Yes, CSIS is um, uh, uh, actually over the years uh, since the inception of, of CSIS in 1984, uh, we have developed between the uh, CSIS and the RCMP very elaborate uh, processes, processes to be able to share information. Uh, you, I think you, the committee has heard uh, some of the challenges that exist in, in using intelligence and, and passing it on to law enforcement agencies or investigative bodies, because intelligence is not uh, a question of, of evidence. So, um, you know, the RCMP in this specific case needs to determine how to use the information uh, and, and further their own investigation. It is a complex process. Uh, the two organizations working with Department of Justice continue to work on this issue. Uh, the notion of, of uh, using intelligence to pursue uh, law enforcement matters continues to be uh, a challenge that, you know, a number of organizations are actively working on. But we do have uh, robust processes with the uh, RCMP and with other uh, law enforcement and investigative bodies to do uh, such an exchange. So on that, um, Mr. Vigneault, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that yesterday the uh, Deputy Minister of Public Safety confirmed that there are actually no investigations into allegations of foreign interference uh, from the last election underway. So based on your, your previous response that information is shared, uh, what they have in front of them, uh, they do not have any active investigations. I'd like to just talk a little bit about the briefings next. You mentioned that you do uh, participant briefings of the panel. Uh, do you personally do that briefing or is that somebody else on your team or along with you? 
Uh, I, I normally, uh, uh, I'm the one who would be doing these briefings. Uh, there might have been uh, one or two that my, uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Director of Operations, uh, may have uh, undertook, but it's normally it will be myself uh, briefing the panel directly. Okay, and from what I understand, um, based on those briefings, there has been no um, incident or incidents of uh, interference that have threatened the integrity of the election. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the, uh, it's indeed the conclusion that the, the panel has, has taken. Uh, they received a, a lot of information, a lot of briefings, and the, the panel uh, can tell you, having been part of the discussions, have been challenging us on our information, on better understanding, uh, the panel members wanting to better understand what we had, and I can tell you that it has been a very uh, robust exchange. And the committee, uh, the, the panel have come to conclusions in 2019 and, and also for the elections in 2021 that indeed uh, that uh, the uh, information did not reach that threshold. And um, based on, on my information and my experience, uh, for what it's worth, Madam Chair, I would say that I concur with that conclusion. Perfect. And I have only about 30 seconds left. Um, you mentioned that you could not comment on um, media reports that may or may not have come from uh, CSIS, whether it be uh, leaks and so on and so forth. As you probably know, my son is an intelligence officer of the Canadian Armed Forces, and I take the, the issue of security and national security extremely seriously. Could you explain quickly what a leak could mean to the intelligence sharing of Five Eyes, and what would that happen if we were to have leaks of top secret information? So, Madam Chair, uh, very quickly, uh, I would say that um, the bread and butter of, of, uh, of an intelligence organization is our ability to collect secrets and, and uh, keep secrets and use those secrets, you know, with the appropriate people. When that ability is threatened, uh, it undermines the confidence of our partners domestically and internationally. And this is something we take very seriously. But I would say it's also the ability of our, uh, to protect our people and our sources, people who put their lives at risk to uh, protect Canada. Take so would you say Thank that you, sorry. letting information our time. like this out would actually put our members of the Canadian Armed Forces at risk? If you can give it in one answer, I would take it. I would say that any, any uh, information that is disclosed uh, uh, in an unauthorized way, uh, is you do not know the consequences. You cannot foresee the consequences down the road. So I think it's, it's very serious. Thank you. Uh, I have matter. to end our time there, and I would... Just like to keep it tight. Um, I will go, Madame Normandin, jusqu'à six. Ms. Normandin, six minutes. Thank you very much to all of the witnesses for being here. You just mentioned that it's a, a hypothetical situation where there are leaks, but in fact, we had a leak apparently to global, and this has serious consequences. But is it perhaps because that uh, the people who had that information were dissatisfied with how the, the information was handled by CSIS or the government? And does it say uh, something about the uh, tensions that might exist? Uh, Madam Chair, I would say that in uh, an intelligence agency like ours, there are always different po points of view and very serious discussions. But I want to assure the committee that issues dealing directly with interference uh, constitute a very important issue, and we discuss them very dis uh, seriously with all of our people, so there's no problem there. There are measures in ceases for people who are dissatisfied with how information is being handled to take a user process to deal with that. We have uh, in CIRA as well a complaint process to deal with classified information. So there are processes and forums for people to explore these concerns. It's not an issue 
that there is this kind of tension within CSIS. Thank you. I want to come back to the issue of donations to the Trudeau Foundation. We know that when the Chinese uh, government is making donations, it's because it is political inf- interference. How, how do you deal with this, and do they come to cease us directly, these kind of complaints? This is an important question, and it's a, a complex matter with respect to to the foundation in question. I believe it it operates at arm's length from the government. So it is not something that CSIS would get involved with directly. That said, if we are aware of information involving a foreign actor that is uh, undertaking disruption activities or interference, then we can take action. On the specific question, CSIS doesn't necessarily have the last word because depending on the situation, there may be other agencies, organizations involved. But in my experience, CSIS is involved in the discussions. Thank you. You mentioned in your opening remarks that when it is appropriate, one of the roles of CSIS is to uh, counter threats. What happens in those situations, and what, who else has a role to play in deciding whether those steps are taken? Madam Chair, the powers that CSIS, CSIS has for countering threats go back to 1998, I believe, the changes were made then, and it's always evolving, uh, evolving uh, how we use those powers. As I mentioned earlier, generally, we don't work alone. We work with our partners uh, to understand clearly the contact, context of the situation and the impacts to ensure that we take the most specific action possible to deal with the threat. So we would not usually take action without consulting our agency, but uh, without taking uh, before taking action. We heard that uh, uh, from our previous witnesses, that is Elections Canada and the Commissioner's Office, that they are not able to take specific action. So I would like to hear from you, since the Prime Minister seemed to brush aside the recommendation that more needed to be done. So is there uh, enough power available to deal with these situations for CSIS? I mentioned in my opening remarks, Madam Chair, that foreign interference is taken seriously, and over the past few years, we have noted that the types and sophistication of foreign interference have evolved, have increased. They have learned how we work and the types of work of powers that we have and and what we can do, and that is why we need to protect certain parts of our information, CSIS, the CSE, the RCMP, and the Commissioner's Office all have complementary powers. And do we need more tools in our toolbox? That's certainly something that we can look at. We work very well together, but uh, there is certainly room for improvement. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and uh, th- thank you very much um, uh, for, for our witnesses, Monsieur Vigneault. Uh, I was uh, tempted to ask the same question I asked yesterday, which is uh, the articles by Robert Fife and Stephen Chase in the Globe and Mail uh, and Sam Cooper in Global News. If you could acknowledge their factual ar- articles, I don't believe you are willing to do that. However, I I do want to ask whether the concerns around multiple liberal and conservative candidates uh, being involved, uh, potentially being favored by Beijing, if this is something 
that you can confirm whether there are multiple liberal and conservative candidates that were of concern. Uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, I think the the uh, the member has uh, has um, had the preview of uh, my answers. I will not be able to speak specifically uh, about uh, who uh, may or may not have been a subject of uh, of interference. What I can say, and we have said that uh, publicly many times over the last number of years, is that uh, foreign interference uh, is uh, the actors who are engaged in foreign interference against Canadians do so at all levels of government, at the federal, provincial, and municipal level, uh, and they're doing it across party lines. The, the goal here for uh, the uh, uh, country uh, organizations who want to interfere is to favor their own, uh, their own interest, and therefore, uh, whatever way they decide, they determine that their, those interests would be uh, pursued more most effectively, they will engage. And that's why we have seen uh, foreign interference across uh, party lines and across uh, different levels of government. Now, I, I want to ask you, uh, following up on uh, Madame Romanato's question around foreign diplomats, uh, when we have a case of a foreign diplomat that is involved in um, in potentially provoking violations of our laws, in this case, the Canada Elections Act, what are the steps that CSIS can take in the case of that diplomat? What What is open to the Canadian government as well? So I would say um, the... the um... Probably, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would structure my answer in, in, in two ways. First is what CSIS can do, which is uh, we would investigate the uh, uh, the information. We would pursue all uh, using all techniques to find as much as possible about uh, the interference of uh, of diplomats based in Canada. Uh, when we have that information, then there's uh, the, the options of, of the service taking uh, the measures directly ourselves using our threat reduction mandate. But in the case of a foreign diplomat, it would uh, I do not foresee a scenario in which we would not engage a GAC. Uh, Global Affairs Canada is the authority in Canada to uh, ensure that uh, the, uh, the enforcement of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, um, they are uh, the ones who are interacting on a day-to-day -day basis with foreign diplomats. And at that point, um, there are different tools, the, the disposal of the government through Global Affairs Canada to uh, be able to uh, uh, enforce the Vienna Convention up to and including uh, declaring someone persona non grata from the country. Um, and so, uh, again... Th thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That, that responds to my question. Uh, you, you did say something that disturbed me um, a few minutes ago. You said, and I, and I quote, I've got quotation marks around it, intelligence is not a question of evidence. Making the distinction between intelligence you receive and uh, evidence that the RCMP or the Commissioner of Elections can act on. So my, my question is, how do you validate intelligence then in that case to ensure uh, that you're moving from intelligence uh, to actual evidence that is actionable? Thank you for the question, uh, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll respond if, if that's okay. We constantly work with our partners in law enforcement, as the Director mentioned, with the Commissioner of Canada Elections, and we share that information. We have those discussions, and they are really the ultimate authority to know what could be of use to them. The challenge for us and the challenge in the system currently is we need to be able to protect our methods of operation. We need to be able to protect our human sources, our technical sources, our employees. And so that sometimes poses challenges, as was mentioned by the panel yesterday, in terms of converting that intelligence into evidence. But the decision in terms of whether to use that information could belong to the Public Prosecutor Office, it could belong, of course, to our RCMP uh, colleagues, and perhaps I'll turn to my RCMP colleague if, he, if there's anything he wants to add from his perspective in terms of uh, sharing information. But I can say that it is a very close partnership, ongoing discussions, and we work quite closely with all involved agencies in trying to action that information. Uh, okay. Now I will go to my next uh, question that deals with the diaspora. You talked about the measures uh, to decrease the, the threat of uh, foreign interference. What are the measures you are undertaking with uh, the diaspora, namely? I'm talking here about the Chinese diaspora, diaspora but also with the Russian, Iranian diaspora. So. Madam Chair, it's a very uh, good question. As mentioned in my um, 
opening remarks. It is a very sensitive issue and it is a priority for CSIS. Ethnocultural uh, communities in Canada are uh, um, in, um, are being pressured when it comes to foreign interference. And to answer your question, in the last year, we've uh, published a report on foreign interference. We've uh, published it in the different Chinese dialects, in Persian and in Russian. We've uh, released a, a guide for communities to better counter foreign interference. So this is a tool. It's a public information tool, we engage people to uh, talk to us to see what more can be done. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We will now go um, for a five-minute round. Madam Dancho, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for being with us today. Regarding the specific allegations uh, report in the Globe and Mail uh, from CSIS documents that Beijing was responsible for illegal cash donations, tax receipts, and hiring campaign workers using illegal methods, as well as disinformation campaigns in the 2021 election, this information from CSIS would have been shared with our Five Eyes intelligence allies. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I will not be in a position uh, to comment specifically on uh, on uh, these allegations, this information. What I can say, however, is that indeed um, CSIS and our intelligence partners do share information uh, extensively with uh, with international partners. Um, this for inter foreign interference, amongst other threats, is one that is shared by many countries. Uh, the PRC specifically and other countries are engaging in foreign interference in other countries. And one of the advantages we have is uh, having a number of, of countries uh, in not only uh, amongst the Five Eyes, but uh, more broadly uh, in, in Western Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, we work very closely with these partners to share information. Mm -hmm. And that is one way we have to protect Canadians is to benefit Thank from you. the en enriched uh, picture here. It was also, it, pardon me, it was also reported that uh, the a Consul General of Beijing took credit for the defeat of a conservative of MP in the 2021 election. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would uh, unfortunately have to reiterate my answer. I cannot specifically confirm uh, uh, some of the information that is in the public domain in this uh, mm -hmm. current setting. Yeah, this has been asked, but I'll ask again. Was the Prime Minister briefed of any of this information, and when would that have been? What would have been the dates? Um, Madam uh, Chair, we will be, uh, as I uh, in answered to the previous question, we endeavoured to uh, be able to provide information to the uh, to, uh, working with PCO uh, to this committee in terms of what has been uh, briefed and mm -hmm. who has been briefed, but I'm not in a position to specifically answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Vignon. I appreciate your service to this country, but I am surprised, uh, of course, you are all aware that you are coming to this committee today, and I know you all take, I'm sure, very detailed notes in your calendar, so I'm a bit surprised that that information is not readily available to committee members members, as I'm sure you anticipated the questions of when the Prime Minister would or would not have been briefed uh, by you or others in CSIS, but I would appreciate if you would provide that in short order uh, to the committee. Thank you. Uh, to the RCMP, has she, CSIS shared any of this information regarding election interference with you? Uh, any sharing of information would have been done through the site committee, and then uh, if, uh, if uh, it falls into the criminal space, the RCMP would investigate. And you're not investigating? That's We're not investigating that any elements from the 2019 or the 2021 elections. We did not receive any actionable intelligence uh, that would warrant us to initiate a criminal investigation. So no charges have been laid to anyone concerning any election interference, is that correct? No charges have been laid. And no charges have been laid concerning the uh, Beijing police stations illegally operating in Canada for the purpose of terrorizing Chinese Canadians. No charges have been laid in that regard either? No, but the RCMP has taken overt actions on four specific sites where we were present in uniform marked vehicles to demonstrate to the community that we're taking this seriously. And we've had a positive impact uh, on the actions that we've taken. And that positive impact in particular, does that mean that the operations from those illegally, uh, illegal uh, Beijing police stations have ceased? We are, our understanding is that they've ceased and we're continuing our investigation of the ongoing. Anytime you have a representative from the embassy who's a law enforcement relation, uh, liaison officer comes up to us and not pleased with the actions we, take, we took, I think that's a mm -hmm. sign that we did our job. 
I we appreciate your work to very up. much in that regard. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was shared in committee from the deputy of uh, uh, Minister of Public Safety that legislative changes would need to be made, or he implied that they would need to be made for charges to be laid. Is that correct? That legislative changes would need to be made for the RCMP to lay charges. Is that correct? When we talk about legislative changes, the RCMP operates in a criminal environment, and this is the work that Michelle alluded to earlier, my colleague, with regards to the work we do with the service. The service is in the intel business, but as the intel starts building towards a criminal offense, that's when it's shifted to the RCMP. So we work with the existing legislation that we have under the criminal so what code. Thank you. Would a criminal would a change to the criminal code ne be needed to lay charges based on the evidence that you have concerning the police stations or election interference? We always entertain new new tools uh, under the code. Has the minister of public safety or anybody from government, the prime minister's office, been briefed that legislative changes would need to be made for charges to be laid? Not to my knowledge. Uh, none of those briefings have happened. I'm saying not to my knowledge. Okay. So the RCMP has not informed the prime minister or any of his cabinet uh, that. Legislative changes are needed for charges to be laid. The RCMP will concern. go through public safety uh, to, for for any change in legislation. Oh, will you be pursuing you. any of those briefs? Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for your for your feedback. Um, excellent. And this brings us to Mr. Fergus. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I first want to thank our witnesses who are here with us today. I feel very encouraged to see the coordination between the RCMP, the our CSIS partners. It's very important to see this coordination so that you are working together to protect Canadians and playing our part with the our international partners. Uh, Mr. Vignon, I want to come back to an answer you gave to Mr. Cooper when he talked about allegations that have come out in the media. If I remember correctly, you confirmed, or rather you re could not confirm the veracity of those allegations? These allegations may or may not uh, uh, come from CSIS. And this leads me to a sensitive question. Now, I know you can't comment about the specific case, but so let me just take this into a hypothetical <laughs> range. When you see, you know, with your knowledge of, of, of foreign interference, uh, and the different techniques which are used in foreign interference, is it possible, uh, in your opinion, that unverified or, or unconfirmed leaks from secret sources uh, that may or may not come from official uh, sources uh, could in itself represent a form of foreign interference? Um, um, Madam Chair. I will answer in English, or rather in French, if you don't mind. I think that this is one of the key aspects of this whole situation. Foreign interference is very complex. There is a whole spectrum of activity that goes from a diplomat that might uh, speak openly to uh, exercise influence, and that would be acceptable. And then there is a whole category of activities that would be a gray area that would be a little more secretive or would be revealed only later, and that would also be foreign interference in a way. So that that's very complex, as you can see. So apartment is the organization, UFWD, United Front Work Department, is an organization of the Communist Party. It is as old as the Chinese Communist Party. Um, under Xi Jinping, this organization uh, you know, has been uh, provided new budgets, and that now they're, they're the budget of the organization dedicated to engage uh, the, the uh, Chinese abroad, but also to interfere in, in other countries' internal affairs that done by the FWD 
The budget of that organization now is bigger than their entire Department of Foreign Affairs. So the, uh, the budget of an organization dedicated to foreign interference is now larger than the entire uh, overt diplomatic work that the, the, the PRC is engaging in. It gives you a sense of how important this is. And I would say very quickly, Madam Chair, this is why um, uh, the President of China, Xi Jinping, calls the UFWD one of its magic weapons. So <laughs> then it's not beyond reasonable to see that undermining uh, uh, democratic systems, democratic institutions uh, could be a primary purpose of, of, of the UFWD. Chair, uh, in terms of foreign interference writ large, uh, carried out by the PRC, but also we have seen it by Russia, this information is one of this very specific tool that is being used. That is why, as an intelligence service, we have very rigorous processes to be able to ingest information, challenge that information, validate it, assess it, and that's how intelligence is then, uh, is then you know, uh, put together at the end. And so that, I would just invite everybody to be mindful that you know, some of the information that may be in the public domain uh, could be accurate, could also be an information that is part of that process, that it's still part of an evaluation and assessment process. So this is why we are very concerned when we see this in the public domain, um, to, uh, because you, know, you need to have experts also be able to assess the specific information. Thank you. Madame Normandin, two minutes et demi. Two and a half minutes for Ms. Normandin. I understand that you can't uh, say whether or not the information uh, that was provided to the Globe and Mail is accurate, but there is information that indicate that some CSIS officials may have leaked information about how information was managed with the PMO and the Prime Minister has brushed aside the possibility that one of his candidates may have had uh, interference work in his favor. favor. So uh, we've got these activities by the Communist Party of China, but I want to hear about whether there are any tensions between your organization and the Prime Minister and the PMO. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, there are various aspects to that question, so I would like to quickly say that there is an investigation underway by CSIS and our partners regarding the sources of the the information, the leak. We are in a democracy. People do have the right to speak freely. And as I said earlier, in response to a question, if there are, there are means that exist already for people to express their discontent regarding relations with the Prime Minister's office, it is clear that our work is to inform the government, and we have every means available to us to do that. And so I can say that communication is open so that CSIS can provide all of the required information. Very quickly, I have little time, but on another issue, would it be useful for CSIS to have a registry of foreign uh, officials and actors for to be able to track down interference. Yes, Madam Chair, I had the opportunity to appear before a different parliamentary committee with Minister Mendocino a few weeks ago, and I would say in response to that question that yes, CSIS has been talking about foreign influence for the last few years, foreign interference, and I think that tool would be useful. It wouldn't solve all our problems, but it would increase transparency. Thank you. Mr. Julia. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I know that you can't share information about Five Eyes. That said, there are similar measures that have to be taken by our partners. 
If we look, for example, at Chinese interference, there are other examples, and I think they are fairly much public knowledge, and there are solutions in place, other places. Uh, when Donald Trump was elected, there was a lot of interference by Russia. As same with the same, the same occurred with Brexit in the United Kingdom. And we had the convoy, as it was called, here in Canada. And we know that Russia was involved in that. So what lessons can we draw from our partners on that, and how can we apply them in Canada? We talk about interference where the diaspora of uh, people from other countries is concerned, but also with within Canada, like the convoy. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may, there were a few aspects that were mentioned uh, that don't match the information that I have, uh, including foreign interference in the convoy activities. That's not the information I have, but I can address lessons that we can draw from situations in other countries. Canada is very fortunate because we have a lot of partners and allies around the world. We work confidentially with other countries through Five Eyes, but also other means. The lessons concerning the register that was already mentioned, uh, that's one that we can take from other countries. And there are things done in Canada that can be useful to other countries as well. Uh, some of them are confidential, and this is how we build our partnerships. Thank you. We will now go to Mr. Bertold for four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Vignon, I have a question for you. I'm a little bit of a novice when it comes to security levels and things. I asked the same question of Ms. Thomas. When information is provided to somebody in a political party that is classified, uh, can that person provide information to others? That, Madam Chair, is one thing that we need to keep learning about and drawing lessons about, because that is one of the examples. The process isn't as clear as that. There are ways for people who have classified information to be able to share it in order to provide advice to people, just like uh, we've got certain committees, but the actual information is classified. Is that correct? Yes, the specific information is classified. So if a person provides, shares that information, that is illegal, so to speak, if it is classified. Yes, specific information would probably be considered illegally shared. But in my experience, this is an information that needs to be held to see how the information can be used. Yes, I understand. You're, there's a distinction between the specific information and advice. So if, a, if CSIS is investigating a specific candidate, then that information can't be shared. I understand the need for the committee members to have specific answers on the, to their questions, but I do have to just take a moment to say that it is not just a matter of providing the information and then washing our hands of it, but rather to provide it to along with means to use it. Yes, we understand that 
classified information under the current system remains classified, and it has to be classified and can't be shared. Madam Chair, very specific information can't be shared. That's correct. Uh, Mr. Vigneault, Ms. Thomas said that uh, CSIS was informed a number of time of a number of complaints regarding foreign in interference in 2019-21. Can you can you uh, confirm that, or rather to the RCMP? No, it's very rare that information would be sent to us. Do you have any information that? Uh, that any information was provided from ministers offices and others no uh, any information that we would have would in involve the site committee can you talk about foreign interference interference by Beijing in 2019 2021 has anything come to your office no Neither to you haven't provided information either to the minister or cabinet. No, if somebody did so without going through the regular channels, I wouldn't know. Well, just going by memory, uh, that's one thing. But can you go through the communications with the? cabinet and all, all others uh, to make sure that uh, that is not the case? Yes, I can commit to doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Merci, Monsieur Bertold. Thank you, Mr. Bertold. Hoda, you will have four minutes and 20 seconds. Thank you. So many more questions and uh, never enough time. Um, I want to thank the witnesses first and foremost. At the beginning of uh, the statements, it was mentioned that many Chinese Canadians become w victim of this type of foreign interference uh, that occurs. Would you also say that candidates could also become blindsided and victim of this type of foreign interference? Canadians? Candidates. Um, um, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair, sorry. Um, I would say that uh, the, the purpose of foreign interference is to, again, push an agenda of a foreign country. And so, uh, as we have mentioned, it takes many different forms. And absolutely, that could include uh, engaging uh, candidates, uh, engaging uh, staff, engaging uh, people of different uh, part of the of Canadian civil society. So, uh, as we have said, uh, everybody is potentially, uh, depending on their position, could be subject to foreign interference. And does your agency regularly inform parliamentarians, brief them on foreign interference and how to protect themselves, especially if a candidate may be a victim of foreign interference? Would your agency uh, brief them about this and have they done so in these uh, occurrences in the past? So, but, Madam Chair, we, uh, we do have uh, uh, briefed uh, many parliamentarians at, across uh, party lines, across uh, different levels of government, as I mentioned before. We also uh, continue to publicly speak about foreign interference. We have publications that exist uh, in terms of specifically foreign interference and the guide in multi uh, available in multiple of languages to help people to s understand very concretely what foreign interference is and what they could do about that. Um, and so the service, uh, the uh, CSIS has been engaged uh, with, with our partners, and I, I believe uh, that the Chief also has uh, examples. Yes. Yes, thank you for the question. I would just add that since 2017, the CSC has been putting out publications with regards to threats to democratic institutions. And one of the things that we clearly outline in that uh, uh, booklet or in the uh, guidance that we've provided to um, democratic institutions and around uh, general elections is that um, foreign interference could happen to those that are voters as well as candidates as well as politicians. So uh, as recently as the 2021 because, election as well. Because I don't have that much time, I also wanted to get into more things. How many countries, how many given countries might be involved in this, these types of activity uh, in Canada? Do you have a ballpark figure of how many countries are involved? So, uh, Madam Chair, I would say that uh, uh, we have publicly acknowledged uh, the uh, interference activities of the, the PRC 
of Iran mm. and of Russia, there's, and there are other countries country. also involved in in that in foreign interference in our uh, in our uh, overall uh, country, not just in the democratic uh, electoral processes. So there are a few countries that you acknowledge publicly, but how many countries? Can, is there a number, an idea? Uh, is it a lot greater than three, or is it uh, you know just a few greater than three? Um, Madam Chair, it's. Uh, <laughs> I would say that uh, it is. Uh, it is uh, more than three. Uh, it, we're not talking about every country engaging in these activities. The uh, most countries do not resort to these types of actions. But indeed, we are concerned about a, a few other countries. Uh, would a public inquiry be? And many of former directors of CSIFs have commented on this recently. Do you believe a public inquiry might be a, a good forum? for us to continue this conversation? And do you think that CSIS and our country would have something to gain uh, instead of having it in, in, a, in a committee hearing like this or at NCCOP or you know, briefings to site? And we've seen that the Rosenberg report has recently come out and I'm sure that you were involved in briefings with them uh, in order for them to reach their conclusions. So. Having done all of these things and being engaged in, in these ways, do you think a public inquiry on top of that uh, would be beneficial? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd say that um, the goal of uh, uh, and the, the, the focus of, of CSIS of the last number of years has been to uh, publicly engage in talking about foreign interference. We're using all platforms available to us, including parliamentary committees. Um, so uh, whatever decision is made uh, to, to continue this discussion, CSIS would be, uh, of course, engaged actively in, in continuing the discussion. The one, of course, remaining uh, consideration is the classified information. How can we find the best possible way of having classified information, you know, uh, part of, of, a, of a classified discussion, but uh, inform the proper debate without becoming public is that the key conundrum. So with that, I would like to thank um, all of our guests for coming. Um, it's been really interesting. It's something that I also often hear is, you know, when does the public get to know these meetings are taking place in public? You've really demonstrated just the level of detail and just the layers of it. So I can speak for myself to say I appreciate that you are responsible for our security and that you are doing really important work. So I thank you and for being available today. I thank you, and I'm going to let witnesses go so that we can get to the next. Well, just it's related to the witnesses. Just very briefly, Madam Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Bino uh, undertook to provide a consolidated response uh, in consultation with PCO. Uh, I would uh, ask that the clerk contact the PCO uh, to uh, request that those, that response be provided within uh, a week. Uh, these are. Uh, the briefings were matters that uh, I think uh, were e easy, easy to anticipate and would not require a significant amount of time for calendars to be checked. So I think we, I appreciate that. And I have full confidence that everyone who is appearing here will get us information as quickly as possible. I have not found one person yet who does not take this matter seriously and who wants to ensure that our elections are protected, um, open and transparent and fair. So I would ask that you provide us information as quickly as possible to the clerk. If there's other information you would like to provide us to the clerk and we'll make sure it's circulated to all members. With that, to, on behalf of committee members, thank you for your service and to your teams. Uh, have a great day and we'll get ready for the next panel. For committee members, I am going to pause, uh, suspend for um, till 1220 so that everyone has time to go to the washroom or take a health break or whatever you need to do. And we will resume at 1220 with the next panel. Thank you and have a great day.